I believe that making professional visual effects has less to do with money, but with your diligence, attention to detail, and how to use available resources. Today I'll be talking about making professional quality VFX using Blender. I'll go over my workflow and lots of additional resources that helped me specifically in creating the visual effects, but it also applies to any CG animation project. If you've been following me on Facebook or Google+, you'll know that I've been helping with a couple student films this past summer in making their visual effects. The films were fun and quite a milestone for me to work on professional ultra HD footage for a quality short film. Sadly, the films won't be released to the public until about a year from now because they'll be going through film festivals. Although I can't show you the final product, I can show some work in progress stills that'll help us in what I'm going over. So, I had sent a poll out on what I should cover in this video, and I added the option in the poll for another Blender workflow, almost as a joke since I've already done it before, and this is the thumbnail for it. But it ended up being voted the highest, so I was kind of confused about that. However, my other workflow video only had subtitle text and no audio narrative which I feel like was difficult for the non-English speakers out there. So, I decided to heed the request of showing my workflow again, even though most of it hasn't changed since my last video. I'll give you the basics from that video, and then any English readers who want more depth can go to that video. Sounds good? Alright. First, I start with the modeling and texturing and materials. You can start this even before you film the video actually. The models don't always need to be complex, but they should definitely be um, UV unwrapped and compatible so that way when you add the textures and materials later, you'll be saving yourself a lot of pain. I definitely am not a superb modeler. <laughs> Just check my videos. Um, and some of the models aren't even mine. I give the creators credit though. More on that later. Although you do not need to be a professional, you should go through some basic tutorials to get the hang of modeling. Um, I highly recommend Blender Guru's tutorials on modeling and texturing. As to how detailed your textures and geometry needs to be, keep in mind it's an anticipated size on the screen, as well as the screen size itself into account. For example, if it's a big tree, a big CG tree in the background on a 1080p video, you probably don't need high resolution textures or lots of geometry. But if the video is in 4K or higher, then you definitely need to consider higher resolution textures and geometry. As for finding texture images and materials, I'll touch on that later. Next, definitely after you've gotten the footage from filming, do any needed motion tracking. The ideal is that you solve the motion tracking with the camera settings, namely the focal length, sensor size, and the lens distortion. As for how to do the motion tracking, I know it's a really ambitious thing in Blender. It scared me when I first did it. I'll give you some references. This is in my other video, but I'd first recommend you to subscribe to Blender Cloud and look at their motion tracking tutorials. I promise I'm not sponsoring anyone for this. This is just what I've learned. <laughs> sure, it's subscription-based with prices, but I did a one-month subscription, viewed the tutorials, downloaded a couple that I wanted for later, and ended the subscription. 17 bucks, and it was so worth it. Although most of the videos are a bit dated, some of the tutorials are for 2.6, and the others are for Blender 2.7, I believe but they cover a lot of great situations you may run into, such as tracking bad footage or needing to use references to properly scale the scene for reconstruction. I highly recommend, I highly recommend those tutorials. My other reference is Sean Kennedy and his website. Who's Sean Kennedy? Well, he's made visual effects and physical effects for over two decades working as a compositor and a 3D generalist in the film business. And he loves using free software, including Blender, and has several great motion tracking tutorials on his website, openvisualeffects.com. 
He gives great commentary and shares some mind-blowing motion tracking techniques, including offset tracking and weightless tracks for solves and reconstruction. And this is mostly a side note, but it's floated around YouTube for quite a while now about an Adobe After Effects script that allows you to export the motion tracking data to Blender. When I first tried it, Blender wasn't able to read the script, and I'd found others online that had the same issue. So when I checked the exported script, the whole script was on one line, as if the enter key wasn't allowed or something. So, but when I opened the script in a cross-platform text editor like WordPad, it was formatted correctly. And it ran perfectly on Blender 2.79 and After Effects 2018, so it still works today with the current software. The script saved me a ton of time, but inputting the camera data seemed to be a hassle. I don't know why, because After Effects seems to like to solve it without worrying about that. I know most of you don't use or have access to After Effects. I did, thanks to the school mat. Anyway, it works if you want to know. Once the tracking is done and you've reconstructed the scene, this would be a good time to animate any objects that need to be animated. Other than maybe motion tracking and compositing, I'd say spend most of your time on animating. I think for the mannequin video, I took nearly a week just animating him. And I had never animated characters before, by the way. This was my first character animation, so yay! Uh, <laughs> I'd say the best tip I've gotten is to make all the movements subtle. You probably heard the term micro-expressions for when people animate CG faces. Overall, don't be too exaggerated in the movement, unless that's a style choice, like for a silent movie-esque type of video. As you can see, the legs move slightly, the head tilts up and down at the end pretty slowly. None of it's really exaggerated or overly dramatic. For the most part, the movements are really subtle in how the legs and arms move. So keep it subtle. Another animating tip I learned, I can't find where I found it, but a good process is to first make the main poses that you want, and then keyframing the midpoint of each of those frames you just did, and then keyframing in between those midpoints, and so on. This can save you, save you lots of time versus keyframing from the beginning, since you'll end up making less keyframes that way. Keyframing every midpoint allows you to be more precise, gives you more flexibility if you end up having to change the timing of the poses. That's what I recommend. It saved me a lot, not just in the CG animation, but when I was using After Effects. All right, next is lighting and then depth of field. I only put these components on one side because the picture shows both. So anyway, first is lighting. Ideally, you should use a HDR image that matches the lighting of the original scene. I used the Scene Skies add-on for this shot and found an afternoon HDR that matched really closely. The lighting color doesn't have to be exact. That can be fixed in compositing. The important things to focus on are the light direction, its brightness, and the softness of the light. These are mostly done just by eyeballing it. I got it close enough, and then the light wrap, glare, and color matching was added in compositing so it matched the footage naturally. The next, of course, is the depth of field. Again, it's best to use the real camera settings, which is mostly just the aperture size setting in the camera pan panel in Blender. That controls the depth of field, and it's measured in f-stops. I didn't have the camera settings on this one, so I was able to eyeball it, and I got pretty close. Some was off due to the reconstruction being a little wonky, but for the most part, it's close enough. Next is setting up the render layers. You may not need to do this depending on the effect, but it's good to learn how the layer system in Blender works. So the render layer basically organizes which layers it renders and what it renders. This can include different render passes, like the Z depth for measuring distance, which is useful for depth of field, the vector pass to measure speed, which is useful for motion blur, and so on. Always set up the default render layer with the main subject, and make sure to include your shadow catcher objects in this render layer. And for the mannequin shot, I made a reflection render layer as well. This had a different floor plane, 
that would reflect the mannequin for the water. The issue was that this floor plane was in the same position as the shadow catcher, and one plane would hide the other in the render and it would start messing up the compositing. So I used the mask and exclude options in the render layers panel to keep them from conflicting with each other. And I used the indirect glossy pass, of course, on the reflection layer to get the reflection. Another tip, um, I didn't do it in the mannequin video, but you can uncheck the use environment box to keep the world lighting from affecting the reflection. This also helped me when I added CG light to a video background and a test image I made. And then right before you render, select all your needed layers in the viewport. That way Blender knows to use them for the render and then the render layers can use them. Now once you've rendered the CG, it's time to do the composite. I love compositing, it's honestly my favorite part. This is honestly what makes the difference from a good render to a superb one. First, you want to analyze and combine the render layers you rendered. For the reflection layer, I did some basic value matting to get the reflection. I also added some displacement to the reflection based on the water underneath it in the video clip so the ripples would affect the reflection. And in the default render layer, I added motion blur and then alpha over that on top of the reflection layer. What makes the big difference is the color matching. As you can see, I colored the CG first to match the original footage, and then I color graded it as a whole with the video and the CG together. The basics of color matching is having the darkest and lightest values of the CG match the darkest and lightest values of the background clip. Usually you don't need to do more than that. Use the uh, UV editor window in Blender to color pick the blacks and whites from the video clip so you can know what color values you should use. And make sure the color balance node is set to offset slash power slash slope, not lift slash gamma slash gain. Uh, long story short, setting it to this preserves the color values better for your CG. This is covered in my other workflow video a little bit, and mostly in um, another Blender Guru video. And finally, add any needed film effects such as lens distortion, vignette, etc. Be conservative on these as a whole, little goes a long way. Again, all of this is covered a little deeper in my other workflow tutorial, but these are the essentials. Alright, I mentioned earlier about finding textures and other assets online. Some of you are fairly new to CG artistry, and you may not know about these sites. Some of you may. There's a greater focus recently on CCO assets, which stands for Creative Commons Zero, which means you can use the asset with no strings attached. You don't have to give credit. You can use it in commercial products, etc. Since I want you to have good resources regardless of budget, I'm going to focus on sites with free CCO assets, because we all want things for free, right? Some of these sites won't be exclusively CCO assets, but I'll talk about using the non-CCO assets as well. First, we have BlendSwap. It's an oldie but a goodie in the Blender community. It's only Blender files, but those files can be anything. It can be objects, materials, scenes, lighting setups, you name it. It has a question section for troubleshooting. Something else I learned about the site is you can make requests. For example, if you couldn't find a certain car, for example, you could make a request for it and someone can make it for you. And also there's a messaging section for hiring people as artists. The downside to this site is that it's not used a lot anymore. It gets little traffic and there's not too many new uploads, but it's definitely a good place to check. I found the mannequin and Batmobile models here for my videos, although I did have to give them credit because they weren't CCO. But anyway, it's an oldie but goodie, definitely worth checking out. Next is a couple recent startups that look really promising. There are three sites under one developer. There's HDRI Haven for HDRs, of course. Archviz, which is for architecture props like chairs and couches. And then Texture Haven, which is for PBR materials and textures. All of them are explicitly CCO only. They don't have a lot on their sites yet, especially Archviz, but the quality is really promising. 
They are donation based, so if you use them, do donate. Come on, I don't like spending money money either, but it's for a good cause, right? Anyway, three startup sites that are very promising. Next is FreeSound for sound assets. Hey, this has CCO assets. Just because it's not of CG doesn't mean it's not useful. For any short CG or VFX videos that you want to show off, you should have good sound to match your video. A tip that I heard from a Blender Guru interview, I think it's one of the VFX ones, good sound can save bad CG VFX, but good VFX won't save bad sound. Any video or film is both a visual and audio experience, well, except for silent films, but you should have both good VFX and sound. Freesound is community-based. There's tons of great samples of object-specific or ambient sounds. There's even some sample music. And a major fraction of it is CCO. It does require an account, but it's quick and easy. Next on the list is CCO Textures. I like it. Simple, easy to remember. And so is the layout. No account, just search for textures. It is fairly new, but it already has hundreds of nice looking P-Brow textures. So definitely one to keep on the list. And lastly, NASA. So I found out about this one during my student film work. The director wanted a couple shots of the night sky with the stars shining, but because we're near cities and towns, there was too much light pollution to see anything. So the director asked me if I could find any usable star images online. I was unsure because the star panorama had to be at least 6K to be the same size as the video would be shooting. So I tried some astronomy sites. I also emailed my dad, who has taken up some astronomy as a hobby. He told me about the NASA website being usable at least for non-commercial. I knew this movie may make profit or money of sort at film festivals and such. So I emailed the guy behind using NASA images about commercial and non-commercial use, and he replied, and I quote, as long as there are no NASA logos or NASA people, you are fine. Sent for my iPhone. So I found a 16K by 8K panorama of the night sky that worked perfectly, and the shots look great. So it's a great place for assets, including a PBR texture for the Earth, but I'd also recommend it for reference images. If you're doing any sci-fi or space shots or stars, this is a perfect place to go for reference images. So that includes my CCO site list. But I have one more final note I want to touch with y'all. My final note in the words of Jack Nicholson, you can have whatever assets you want, but you have to ask me nicely. I know it's nice to use CCO assets since there's essentially no strings attached. Believe me, I use them all the time. But even when you use CCO assets, it's good courtesy to give credit where credit is due. Even Valve gave credit to NASA in their credits for their CG of the Earth and the Moon in Portal 2. Did they have to? No. But it was awfully nice of them. And we should be nice too. And don't be too exclusive to use CCO assets. There may be cases, especially in professional settings, that you may need better assets. For the Marvel films, different VFX studios worked on each VFX character for different movies, so they often send each other their models and rigs to save time, even if they're redone. And honestly, all these people are asking is to give them credit. For my mannequin video, the mannequin stock footage aren't mine, and all I did was put their names in the description along with the respective links. That's it. But don't get me wrong, you should try to be original. Ideally, you should make your own assets and textures just so you can have the whole project belong to you and it looks much better on a portfolio. My mannequin was originally meant to be a test. That's why I didn't mind using other assets. But when needed, use CCO assets and others and give credit as often as you can. It's a courtesy of the art world. Remember, you have to ask me nicely. Thank you for watching. Hope you learned a lot from this. Please share this video. Show your show your gratitude for seeing this. Spread the knowledge. I want everyone to be able to, to learn what I've learned. What did you think about the design of the video? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Was there something that I said that was wrong? Leave it in comments. Let me know.